consumer food trends and kind of the evolution of what's happening in the food industry is what we're gonna be discussing today. It's gonna to be talking about everything from, well, you know, packaging to some of the foods that both consumers and restaurant operators are focusing in on. My name is Paul Barron and this is the Barron Report. Today I've got with me Liz Moscow, who is the International Food Trendologist and VP of Brand Development over at Next Bite. Great to have you, Liz. Thanks, good to be here. Yeah. So Liz, let's get into a little bit about your background. A trendologist, I like that term. Tell me a little bit about what you do at Next Bite and kind of a little bit about the research we're going to be discussing today. Sure. At Next Bite, I develop the brands for the future. So we look at a lot of what's happening with consumer behavior and what will happen with consumer behavior. And so I use my trendology skill set to really anticipate how consumers will be reacting towards different changes in what's happening in, in the sociological factors in the world. So we look at what's happening, obviously, in the political landscape. We look at what's happening in the technology landscape, for example, and we see how that would trickle down into consumer behavior, ultimately, in what people are purchasing at store. And so you can see cool. how that would be very relevant as someone who's creating brands for the virtual kitchen space to really right. be able to move quickly to capitalize on that consumer behavior and those shifts of consumer behavior. Yeah, we've had some of your team on here before talking about the virtual brand space itself, kind of the, the evolution of where the potentially the restaurant industry, and I keep hearing from more and more people that this could be much bigger uh, than what we've ever expected in terms of how brands, either existing brands or new brands, and I know there's gonna be some things on your list here that would be uh, interesting to talk about when it comes to that, but that this could become a, a very, very large part of the restaurant business maybe in the next decade, uh, potentially seeing had a, a guy on one of our tech shows just the other day that uh, was anticipating as much as 50% of restaurants could be virtual or digital uh, within the next five years. That's that's a pretty big prediction. Um, I wanna get into kind of, when you look at the research itself, when you guys are diving into research, what are some of the sources? How do you go about gathering the, the data itself? What's the process? Yeah, I work with a company called Spoonshot, which came out of the Techstars um, business incubator um, in Minnesota. Okay. They did a food specific uh, to help them get their platform where it needs to be. And, and it's, it's a great resource now that many CPG companies are using it to help them predict what products that they should launch. Right. And so mm -hmm. what they do is they aggregate all sorts of data from many different places. So anything from social media, what's being seen on Pinterest, menus all over the globe, um, right. what's on shelf all over the globe and different types of segments and markets. And they put uh, you know, their AI lens on it and figure out what could be trending. So they will spit out a lot of data that wouldn't make sense to the, to the anyone's normal eye, right? They would see things that, that that are trending or growing, but not necessarily understand how that relates to the food landscape. And that's where someone like I come in as a tra yeah. translator of trends and say, okay, well, this sort of data indicates a shift to um, consumers wanting, for example, more collagen. So there's a one small data point that we like to talk about that there was this hashtag that kept popping up in social media and all sorts of different platforms that was hashtag HYP which means hydroxyproline. And so that was an indicator to me, not necessarily anyone else, that people in the vegan space are looking to find results and solutions for collagen because that collagen yeah. is a, an animal-based product, but it is yeah. a big trend of people talking about gut health. So for example, they'll uncover right. things that hashtags, for example, that are trending and we understand why and then translate that to how that will be used in a consumer product on a consumer menu or in the consumer space in general. Yeah, I, I like the fact that it's, uh, I mean, we, we do some of that here on our own uh, with Foodable Labs where it helps us kind of move in the direction from an editorial or we, we are able to pick out brands and, and some of the things that are happening within those brands uh, that help us identify winners and losers kind of thing. Um, and it's been, I've been amazed at how accurate the, uh, the social uh, listening and somewhat, um, I won't call it telepathic, but it seems to be kind of, uh, you know, telepathing people's moves in terms of how how uh, consumers are reacting to certain things that are happening within restaurant brands, especially around menu items. Um, that seems to be the hottest issue right now. And then, of course, you know, with COVID, um, it's all about safety and 
And we're going to get into that, um, in, into some of your topics. I want to kind of run into a few of your topics that you sent to us. One is the uh, term sugar rush, and that probably is not the term we're thinking. Talk to me about what this trend means. Yeah, there's all sorts of solutions coming out of the need for people to eat less sugar or have the sugar reduction in anything from consumer packaged goods to their daily diet, to what they're eating in a restaurant, to a smoothie, for example. And right. so there's these high tech solutions happening where it's, um, you know, they're figuring out how to molecularly change sugar. They're calling hollow sugar um, so, right. so that you get all of the flavor, but in, in a lot less of the surface area. So things sure. taste just as sweet to your tongue, but or have half the amount of sugar in some cases. Um, to, to using different ingredients that have a slower insulin response so that your body is still tasting sugar, but your body's processing in a different way. We're seeing all sorts of products, um, even on the shelf, for example, at your local market, you'll now start to see things like allulose, which wasn't right. something commercially available to put in your coffee by the spoonful. So people driven by this sort of bad carbs mindset or the popularity of the keto diet are really looking for ways for t things to taste as sweet as possible without being artificial tasting, um, lowering the need for their bitter, bitter blocker flavors, like in things like stevia, which weren't necessarily a great exactly. alternative in the past. Those are becoming better as well with the use of these sugar technologies. Yeah. It's funny that you guys mentioned this because one of the sugars I use, which is a monk fruit sugar, I actually found out upon and by on social media and through uh, you know some people I follow in their keto diet videos, and they rave about this evolution. And even though it's kind of kind of pricey, uh, but it does seem like that's uh, that's an area that I think we're seeing more and more movement on. I would love to see more of that being implemented into uh, like desserts and bakery items, you know, things oh, like that. Is. You know, yeah, so yeah. huge, huge opportunity here. I would think for the right kind of operator that's out there, whether you're a you know a direct consumer or a uh, you know a restaurant themselves, implementing these things. Do you have you seen any of that actually happen? Seen some sort of test market. So Nestle released a, um, a chocolate bar a couple of years ago. I believe it was called Wholesomes that used sort of this hollow sugar technology that had less sugar. It was not the right time. I think they were a little early. So I would look to them to relaunch something like that in the near future. Yeah. Um, and then just seeing those um, bitter blocker technology. There's a company called Mycotechnology based in Denver that I'm aware of that uses mushroom fermentation to reduce the bitter flavors and things. So if you think about right. the past stevias and monk fruits having sort of that bitter off taste, I know that they're currently working on prod products with other companies to make stevias and monk fruits more palatable as well. Yeah, I, this is kind of off your list, but I'm curious um, in, in your findings, uh, did you guys see any kind of trends that were going in the direction of superfoods? There's a few, a handful of companies that have really kind of isolated in on these superfood uh, components, everything from Laird's to, you know, even one we had on, which was a beverage company that was kind of recreating, um, you know, their particular category. What are you seeing in the area of superfoods around these trends? You know, superfoods is a moniker that can refer to things that's sort of the perfect nutrition density of food, but it could also leverage sort of the super fruit category that are right. things that are naturally occurring that have good nutrition involved in them. I've also seen um, in, in terms of superfoods is that sort of the different way of eating is eating is a diverse set of ingredients as you possibly can. If you think about it, most right. people have their sort of top 30 go-to foods, whether that encompasses some certain meats and vegetables, but the more you can eat, and this will be trending next year, I think people will start to understand that eating a diverse set of food types gives yeah. you the types of ingre uh, uh, nutrients that your body may not be getting so that you can cut down on supplementation and, and, and things that give you that um, in, in a way that doesn't come from your food. So in terms yeah. of perfect foods and superfoods. I, I believe you were referring to the, the Lairds of the world that are giving you these, these, these options for powders or things that you could put in your coffee or supplements to create mm -hmm. this natural, perfect diet for yourself. But I think there are many ways in to create that and you'll be seeing that sort of shift and that, those, that word being used interchangeably um, in the coming future. Yeah, I, I, I can't, uh, you know, I, I was playing with the keto diet. I do a lot of experimentation, kind of biohacking on my own body. And I continuously explore different kinds of areas like that. It usually uncovers, you know, some of these companies that are doing some very intriguing things, at least in the use of ingredients 
uh, which is always refreshing to find. All right, so you talk about uh, packaging and design and kind of the whole presentation model of how food is being delivered now. Talk to me about that trend. Yeah, well, if you see what happened with COVID, that virtually overnight food trends changed because the where the purchase driver behind them has changed. So right. we went from wanting to go to the store, needing to go to the store to get our food, to sort of feeling, you know, leading with fear, not being able to go into the store or find our ingredient and shifting completely to online, whether that's through right. Instacart or Shipped or um, I'm getting your food online through a third-party delivery app. The way that we need to process those offerings has completely changed. And so brands, CBG, food, restaurant brands need to change the way they are displaying their information to a digital audience. So some of those things are obviously speaking more concisely in their messaging because the digital audience has much less of an attention span online, whether they're looking on their mobile device in a small area, they need to get that communicated to them more quickly and more concisely. So you'll start to see and already have seen um, descriptors that are much shorter, getting less yeah. information um, in, 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 one, in one visit than you would on a giant pack or on a menu. So more concise, brief speak from the brand, yeah. for example, and also the where that information is being presented. So if exactly. you think about wanting to not touch products on shelf, if you are in the market, and that information needs to be communicated right on the front of the package, pretty right. large, so you don't feel the need to pick up the package to explore it. Yeah, good point, uh, which kind of takes us to the next trend, and that is this uh, handmade, handcrafted, not necessarily as chic as it used to be. Tell me why. Well, you wouldn't necessarily want to think about too many hands touching the food that you're going to ingest right now in a COVID world. And so some of those cues and monikers that we talk about is related to food, house-made, homemade, handcrafted, don't necessarily tie into your head an image of something you want to eat right now. And so right. we're going to start to see some of those things shift to sanitation verified. This food was made by robots. This food was made in a clean room. <laughs> and some messaging around the safety and sanitation of food as that being the epitome of what you would like to purchase as opposed to thinking about say some a grandma and her trattoria making dough with her hands isn't necessarily yeah. what you want to be eating right now for sure you know that that kind of lines up with a a trend that we identified on uh direct to takeout uh which i'm, I'm kind of curious uh, a question for you at next bite there is uh we kind of uh looked at uh, some trends over last year, meaning 2019 versus 2020. And what we were finding is an uplift in actual direct to takeout versus third party uh, delivery, which kind of falls into this trend you just mentioned, because with direct to takeout, you're kind of eliminating, well, you are eliminating a third party driver picking up your food, uh, people handling it, all those kinds of things. Um, do you feel like a trend like that could impact these virtual restaurants and digital restaurants, obviously because of the, even though there is a huge amount of growth for third party marketplaces, but I'm just kind of curious if that does pick up to where we see a lot more people going to a restaurant to pick up their food, does that give the virtual and digital restaurants uh, more of a disadvantage? Because at some point they're gonna have to re you know, create some pickup window windows or some kind of consumer interface, which is not typically uh, the scenario that on a vid virtual or a digital brand. What are your thoughts on that? So let me understand your question. I think it's twofold. One is, is third party delivery going to be able to compete with direct to consumer um, restaurants setting up their own way to sort of either deliver or get pickup? Well, well, actually, no. The data was showing that we saw a 14% increase in people ordering the food and going to pick it up themselves. Right. Right. which was considerable uh, because the increases that we'd seen in past years were in the single digits, you know, two, three, less yes. than. Um, yes. So this is a massive move of people going to pick up the food themselves. If that continues, um, typically a virtual or a digital, as you know, is working in the third party marketplace. So if this continues to rise, 
this has got, I mean, the numbers just can't stay the same. We're going to see less and less of, of third party. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, thank you for clarifying. So if you think about it, why people are going to pick it up right now, it's because they're home all day now and they stay at home. Yeah. A lot of people aren't going out and they have the time to go pick it up. Third party delivery is a convenience. And as our lives get back to normal post COVID, that convenience is going to be needed once again. So if you pair yeah. that with the increase in spend that you pay for this convenience of delivery, um, right now people have less money. They're more concerned about um, preserving right. their capital and keeping their money in an unsure or uncertain times. So they're more yeah. likely to go and say, yeah, I need this food and it's okay. Let's get in the car. That's our outing for the day and pick it up and bring it home. As we emerge from COVID, I believe that need for consumer convenience through delivery will rise again. So I don't think from that perspective, the third party delivery apps have anything to worry about. Um, I do think that once COVID is over as well, and people are more out and about, again, that drive to go pick up things to be social will stay around a little bit, but I don't think the driver of, of convenience um, is gonna go away. And I think yeah. they don't have anything to worry about in that case. Yeah. I guess it will all depend on, you know, the economic state, uh, whether or not we're in a, you know, recession or even a depression right. uh, coming out of this and, and all those kind of economic uh, f flows on this. Your next topic was digital influence impact. People not in the food business now getting into the restaurant business. Are you seeing a lot of that? Is that something that you feel like is, is kind of just uh, a fad or wh where is that going? We are. We're starting to see, um, you know, with the rise of the virtual restaurant and the ghost kitchen concepts uh, in the space that I work in is that a lot of it has to do with being able to combat marketing spend and substitute that with influence. So pairing right. with the right influencers to create brands. Um, so that that reach can expand quickly so that you can get yeah. up and running faster. And so if you see some of the things that have launched so far in the marketplace, Tiger Bites, Mr. Yeah. Beast having um, a fast food brand. These are not necessarily, neither one of them is a food influencer or has sure. anything to do with food originally, right? A rapper, a gamer, um, a, a YouTuber. Um, and, and so attaching their names to these brands is a whole new way of really touching different audiences with food. So it's going to be the Wild West for a while as we see different <laughs> types of influencers want to have food brands and, and how much touch they're going to have on those brands. Are they going to let people, for example, like me, control that brand because we understand food and what it needs to be and then just attach their name? So it, it, it's a really interesting place to be right now um, as a, you know somebody who's trained in in culinary and has been a chef in the past, I try to think that people who have some engagement with or passion for food and also happen to have a big following and be successful in the food space will ultimately be that sort of sweet spot of, of development for food concepts. Yeah, that'll be fun to watch uh, to see how that, because you're right, it's, it could really become Somewhat interesting because um, uh, we we've been looking at that kind of movement uh, for the past few years of of you know celebrity chefs that are not maybe as effective as they used to be in certain markets and that maybe the customer is looking for something else and maybe this is the the pathway in which they can get there direct to consumer. Uh, we've seen a lot of food companies now, especially in the specialty food uh, categories, really ramping up. Uh, to go to this uh, this direction in terms of their strategy. How do you see this moving forward? I see it getting bigger and bigger and better. Um, yeah. Consumers are shopping online now, right? More and more every single day and, and eliminating the middleman and getting those cost efficiencies is huge. Right. And we see you know, it was sort of forced the hand during COVID when supply chains were disrupted and people were searching for things, anything from toilet paper online from their local sanitation company that they never would have thought to go to um, and get giant rolls of toilet paper for cheaper at home to uh, people calling their farm and getting their beef delivered to the park lot near their house and eliminating yeah. that middleman completely and i yeah, don't see I, that I, stopping anytime soon yeah i feel like i i'm now shopping at a whole lot more places you know versus the you know the big box store that usually you could go and get multiple things for it seems like there are a lot of cottage industries that are being developed here so i would definitely agree with that one experiential dining because that this is something we've talked about on the show before how does a fine dining restaurant translate what they're trying to do when you have uh, a large percentage of your business that's going to take out? How do you see that working out in the, this year and the coming years? 
you know, chefs are creatives at their core, right? So they're hardworking creatives who are finding ways around the problems that they have. And there's some really interesting things popping out of that, whether it's a chef doing an online cooking class or sending over the ingredients and, and giving their presence to people via Zoom, to creating their own meal kits, to um, partnering with local grocery stores and their restaurant prepared food space to give people that food that they expect from in store that they can have at home through that channel that they're already shopping in. Um, I do see this morphing as more, more people get the vaccine and um, Corona sort of, we can see it in the rear view window is that um, restaurateurs have understood now that you know, they've always understood that dining is more than just eating, that it's an experience that they need to create. Yeah. It's usually an experience of love and warmth. Um, but, but really focusing in that attention on how can we enhance that experience through service, uniqueness, and tailoring it to smaller groups, I can see that becoming more of an offering, sort of custom menus for groups that they necessarily would have in the past done only for large parties. I can right. see those restaurateurs really creating these unique experiences for anyone who comes to show up together as people really crave to get back together to that connection point. Yeah. So yeah. I wish started, that product yeah, was okay. available now. It, yeah. you know, I haven't I haven't seen it yet, but I keep thinking that it's gonna be coming. Uh, man, I would take a, a take restaurants up on that so fast. It would be so amazing just to have a, a real you know, because our kids, we don't take them out anymore. So the, the kids right. are even asking, when are we going to go to a restaurant again? You know, and th and those are the kind of things and we try to bring it into them, which would be an, a great opportunity. Let's talk about elevating uh, diverse ownership, how that's going to affect. Obviously, we've seen a lot of movement and somewhat, um, you know, it's kind of going in, in, in unique directions here in the U.S., now, where do you see that implementing into the food space? How does that over, you know, spill over into what we're de dealing with here in the restaurant industry? Yeah, black, indigenous, and other people of color are really on the rise now. There's an awareness that for so long their brands and companies and and businesses have not been elevated enough, and I think yeah. they're they're. That's starting to happen. Yesterday on DoorDash, when I was looking for what to order myself, I saw that there was a black-owned Thai company. It was spelled out in right. the app, and I think things like that are important. We also can start to see, once we are getting back into restaurants, and uh, that the products that BIPOC companies make as well can be highlighted on the menu, much like your local farm used to be, right? right Sometimes we'd right. see a call out of where carrots came from in your local farm. But it would be really nice to see these, these BIPOC companies highlighted on restaurant menus as well as a way that consumers can support them and, and signal to them that this is something that they want and to continue producing. That I think is a great uh, thing that's happening. It's definitely about time. Uh, last topic, vegan over-the-top food. Explain that, because uh, that sounds like a whole lot of cauliflower. Yeah, no, I'm hoping it's <laughs> not a whole lot of cauliflower. That's the whole thing. Uh, so it, vegan came on fast, right? Vegan turned into plant-based, and everyone picked up on it, and now you can't go a day without hearing the word plant-based. Right. So it used to be that as long as you had a pasta with some sort of a a tomato concoction on top, you are satisfying vegans. <laughs> um, they're not they're not satisfied by that anymore, nor should they be. Yeah. And so they're demanding just as delicious options as um, you know people who, who eat meat. And so we're starting right. to see products in both CPG and restaurants and even in the fast food space and even in third party apps that are making these craveable, delicious products out of nuts and cheeses and plants that can rival uh, the taste of the regular. So anything from a cashew queso by Siete Family Foods that makes delicious queso that you would swear was made out of cheese to some of the, the, the great other sort of charcuterie board worthy style cheese companies like Treeline to um, you know next level burger uh, as a right. chain out of uh, the Portland area that's making delicious vegan burgers with all sorts of vegan faux meat toppings and cheeses as well that you, it, what you could easily give to your favorite meat eater and they'd be satisfied as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've seen that brand. Uh, they look like they're starting to track well too, as uh, which is kind of fun to see how some of those markets are going to continue to kind of expand. Is there any uh, particular trend that you guys are looking at right now here that we are in the, you know, the beginning of 2021 that maybe could be appearing, but 
maybe it's more of a forecasted trend, a, more of a long-term trend, but there are signs of it. Because a lot of times with operators, they're really kind of, now especially, they feel, at least the people I talk to, they're always trying to look at two and three chess moves ahead. Because uh, yeah. obviously preparation, dealing with those kind of things. What are you guys seeing in that in that particular area of kind of, you know, way off forecasting, a little bit out there on the bleeding edge? Yeah, it's it is going to be a funny answer because it's not bleeding edge at all. But uh, the, the fact that we're calling it out is on the bleeding edge. So if you think about uh, how consumers are eating now in that comfort food space, you think about comfort food as pretty close in things that people have gravitated to during times of uncertainty. And I don't necessarily think that pendulum swing, some, some food trendologists are saying that pendulum is going to swing once COVID is over and people will be going crazy with their food exploration, but I right. don't. Um, and so I do think that they're going to use that base of comfort food and explore there safely. So maybe it's comfort foods of different regions, starting to see more uh, of that comfort okay. Food Mexican, for example, where they're exploring more regional Mexico, Mexican specialties like carnitas, um, guisadas, like like stews, for example, yep. different kinds of stews like arropa vieja from Cuba that, that satisfy that comfort bite and that can understand how that relates to the comfort foods that they're used to eating, but take it one step further with a global spin. And I think we're yeah. going to be seeing a lot of sort of these gateway, these gateway global concoctions coming up in the next year yeah. or two. Interesting. You know, I would, I, yeah, it's interesting. I don't know that, uh, obviously these are, are great trends to discuss. The question will be how, how that, it, that'll be an interesting one because that's kind of a bit of a, uh, a chess move if you are implementing something like that as a brand, especially, uh, cause you're going to be camping on the idea that maybe comfort is going to be a, a long-term trend here versus, where we were seeing pre-COVID, but even though we still see some uh, some trends going in this direction, of the you know the um, more healthy or better for you concepts that have been kind of popping up, but pre-COVID they were on track and really on fire, and we we did see a little bit of a, a slowdown uh, once the COVID kind of started getting into the midst of the restaurant industry. So this will be fun to to watch how this plays out for you. Liz Moscow, it's been great having you on the show today. Thank you so much for stopping in uh, over from Next Bite. Thanks so much, Paul. I appreciate being here. It was fun. Uh, okay. All right, Liz, uh, great having her on. I, I love these, these trends. We continue to kind of track through these. We're going to continue some of our uh, anticipatory trends in a lot of beverage and food categories. We've got some stuff coming up over on Taste Kitchen in the wine category. We've got some cool trends in terms of food ingredients and menu uh, that we'll be talking about in various uh, shows here. So if you are listening over on the podcast, whether it's on Spotify or uh, maybe iTunes, make sure and give us a rating or uh, a comment on the show. That's how we get feedback from you. It's also how we understand what you do and don't like here on the show on Barron Report. If you have an idea for someone to be on, make sure and just send us uh, an email to producer at Foodable TV. Uh, and you can also reach me on Twitter, just at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on the Barron Report. 